need it, let me know. Uh, this is more of a forum than a speech, so if you got questions as things go on, say so. Or if you have something to add, say so. Uh, I learned the art of drumming, drum making from Pat Cooperman. And I was fortunate enough to spend quite a few years with him before he passed. But uh, Pat taught me everything he knew about the drum, and hopefully we can share a lot of that with you too. Uh, Pat was one of the first sutlers or vendors at Deep River Muster every year when he used to turn his drumsticks. But he had a particularly good story about a person who brought a drum up to him on one of these Deep River Musters and said that he had a very special drum and that the drum maker said that the shell was very special. And that's why his drum was so good. And so Pat picked it up, looked in the vet hall, and told him he knew why this drum was so special. And the guy said, well, why is that? And he said, it's bullshit. <laughs> you know, that was basically, Pat was very to the point. You know, that everybody's drum is very special to them. And this isn't to say a Cooperman drum is more special than anyone else's. But that basically everybody has their idea of what a good drum is, what a drum should sound like and it should sound the best you can make it. So, we do have a manual on drum making, or on drum maintenance, and it has some very basic facts to it. I think there's about a thousand years of drummers in here. I'm not sure you need to know all about that, but we do have a, website you can go to on drum presses. Uh, the West Point guys also have a website on how to maintain and press a drum and so on. So what we would like to do, maybe take it a little step further and get into more of the details of a drum and talk about what it takes to make a drum sound good. So, we can start on the outside with the rope. Now this has the linen rope on it, but there are a lot of synthetic ropes out there too. So the linens and the hemp's are used primarily as a traditional rope, but also if someone is in the reenactment of actual time periods, 18th, 19th century drumming. The synthetic ropes hold up much better now and so you'll see a lot of people even though they have skin heads on it that they'll switch to the synthetic rope because you won't have to maintain it quite as much the worst thing that people have is having to pull a drum and if it wasn't for pulling a drum you would <coughs> probably not see many rod tension drums in the room this weekend but that's the unfortunate part of it. To take the drum apart, it, again, traditional to have a drag rope on the bottom of it. Not necessary. It was actually used to sling around the shoulder and carry the drum. And it's still used that way today, but a lot of it's just about decoration. And as soon as you can do a drag rope, and the pigtail, then all you have to do is get the slack out of the rope, and the rope drum isn't that intimidating anymore. <coughs> the drag rope is just a series of slip knots so that taking the drum apart quickly and easily. <coughs> Just gonna loosen this up quickly. What I'd like to do is show you and talk about 
the bearing edges of the drum because there is not necessarily a good bearing edge and a bad bearing edge, but it all has to do about attack or sustaining sound. So if you have a sharper bearing edge, you've got more of an attack to work on. One of the critical things about having a drum is checking not just the bearing edge, but if you have flat edges. So if you have a glass table, if you have a table saw, anything you can do to take the drum apart and rub, rub the shell on a flat surface and checking anywhere you can for high spots and low spots. You can take a drum and put it together all day long. And if you have a high, low spot on the shell, you're gonna have trouble with the drum. The other thing is once you've got a flat bearing edge on the shell, you have to make sure that the muffler is what you want. A two inch muffler, is very common. A lot of people, this was mostly prevalent in the 80s, early 90s. We started trimming it down to a one inch strip and it opened the drum up a little more. But again, this is about preference of sound, what you're trying to reach, what are you looking for. This particular drum has calfskin heads. Yes. It has a rounded bearing edge, which was prevalent in the <coughs> earlier Cooperman drums. This was a very common edge also <coughs> with molar drums, 30s, 40s, 50s. <coughs> and over the years, the edges have gotten much sharper because they're looking for more of an attack sound. They're looking for a sound off the head, more so than a resonation through the shell. Now, the original drums were all single ply shells, and then Civil War time, they introduced the two ply shell. It got popular with the three ply shell in the 30s, and moved on up to five ply shells in the 70s, 80s, and so on. Now, <coughs> our drums since the 90s have been also back to <coughs> one ply shell, and that's to do with resonation going through the drum. If you have five ply shells, you have four layers of glue, which will keep the drum from resonating quite so much. If you have a one ply shell, Everything is wide open. Also, over the years, the snare gut has changed, where in the early to mid-1900s, there was very thick snare gut. And over the years, as uh, the drummers discriminate a little more. They're, the snares are turning thinner and thinner. Uh, it's a more sensitive sound, probably not as beefy or quite as far carried. But that's not to say any drum is right or wrong. It's depending on what sound are you looking for. One of the Worst problems with synthetic heads is that you can have, say, a fiber skin head that will last you 20 years or more, but if it's stretched out in the center, it's, you're going to lose the sound because unlike a calfskin head, which can contract and go back to its original shape, the plastic head will stretch 
and stay that way. So if you're losing sound on a drum, keep in mind that the plastic heads do have to be switched out quite a bit. Now the old snare strainers were very crude. Some of them were non-existent, were what we call the press fit. They just laid snares across the bottom of the drum and pressed it, and that was it. They tried to keep the snares taut and so they could vibrate, but there was no adjustment at all. <clears throat> then the J-hook strainer uh, started in the 1500s, Europe, Germany, Switzerland, had the J-hook. It's still being used today. Also has its drawbacks. The 19th century snare strainer was hoop mounted. Uh, maybe a little more improvement because you could get a little more snare sound. And then that grew. You'll see the World War I drums where there is adjustment on the top of the hoop, but still mounted on the bottom hoop. And then it evolved into the molar strainers, the Soismans, and so on. This snare strainer, uh, Pat picked because he felt it gave optimum sound to the drum, so that when you have just a small break at the edge on both sides, then you're not choking off the edge of the drum. Where if a strainer gives you a 90 degree turn on the edge of the shell, it's going to help choke it. You're, not, you're going to get good sound in the center, but not necessarily at the edge. And again, that's a Cooperman theory. Um, I'm sure some could dispute it. <laughs> I've got another drum here. This is a, a Lion and Healy drum. Uh, this is one of those things where everything that's on it needs fixing. So, but if you're a serious drummer, most drummers like to collect drums. Uh, I can talk to Gary about that. But uh, he'll show you the pluses and minus of all vintage antique drums. So this drum in itself is a nice, valuable drum, but when you start adding up the time, the labor, the parts, and so on, maybe not so much. Of course, the heads are shot, but the hardware, <coughs> though it's intact, will need a lot of work and cleaning up to do. So you got to realize that there is always work to be done, even from a new drum to a very old drum. You always want to keep tweaking it until you hit that sound. Now, the value of an antique drum can vary quite a bit if you put too much labor into it and you plan on reselling it, you can ruin the value of the drum. Whereas, if you can make it functional without distorting too much about the parts, the looks, and so on, you've got a good drum. Probably the first thing that should go is the clothesline rope. <laughs> yeah. Most all rope was twisted and not braided. This is braided rope. Although it's very old rope, looks nice on the drum, probably not too authentic. Unless you say in 1950 it was very authentic because a lot of people used it. The uh, snares are still untapped, although there's a little bit of uh, dismembering going on here, but probably very salvageable. 